On this special women branding and basketball episode of This League, we talk about what basketball means to me, how the women, which it, I mean, it means a lot. It means a lot. How the women's game uh, has an image problem, which it does. And uh, I mean, it's a big problem and what people are doing about it, which is not enough, but things are changing. And we have not one, not two, but three phenomenal women that are elite in their craft on the show. Naismith Defensive Player of the Year, Dee Dee Richards from Baylor, just a stud. Two-time Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Year and Pac-12 Player of the Year, Ari McDonald. Just nasty. And no slouch herself, Barstool Sports CEO and media branding genius, Erica Nardini. All right, Marty. Without further ado, let's drop the fucking beat. Marty, do you know how long basketball has been a part of my life and a part of my DNA? Uh, It seems like a while, I would say, (laughs) since youth. I was five years old when I picked up a basketball. My mom, actually, the incredible genius that she is, she basically said to my family and to my dad, my dad gives zero fucks about basketball or (laughs) sports or anything physical. But she was like this Frankenstein-esque parent where she knew that, she knew that eye-hand coordination and ball, like ball sports, Mm -hmm. were integral in building the brain and language skills and mathematical skills of a kid. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted me to be like a little baby Einstein. So she put a ball in my hand at like, <laughs> I mean, as, as soon as I could hold a ball, she was throwing me a ball. It was like a parenting technique to get you into basketball? No, I think it was a parenting <laughs> technique to get me into being a little mathematical phenom. Right. She wanted me fine motor skills, develop your language skills and ability to process complex topics like math. So that was what she was trying to do. And also she's competitive as hell. So we were playing... We were playing ball sports from the time I was like 18 months old. So I got a basketball in my hand very early. She never was great at basketball, but I think probably four or five years old, I started actually trying to play. Mm -hmm. Started with the underhand shit. And eventually when we moved to Portland and I was in a different, totally different neighborhood, I really, really got into the game. And I would think I was, I was six when my mom and dad divorced nasty, messy, gross. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is, right? (laughs) And basketball became an escape. Me and the kids going out and me playing with kids that were like three or four years older. Mm -hmm. And I was in a new neighborhood, not yet accepted. I was tiny. I was like four foot five, four foot four at that point in time. Just just a little scrawny thing, Mm -hmm. playing with the boys, growing up with them. And I was... I mean, because my mom was Frankenstein type of a person, I was pretty good with the ball right away. And when the WNBA came out, I thought like for sure I was going to be in it. (laughs) I remember telling my mom, like, don't worry. Uh, I don't need to learn how to cook. What a delusional little ass kid. (laughs) Don't worry, mom. I don't need to learn how to cook. I'm going to have my own chef. I'm like eight. I'm going to have my own chef. I'm going to be a WNBA player. I'm going to be a pro. And don't worry about it. not knowing that like WNBA players have second jobs because they can't afford to do anything outside of their gig. Right. Right. So, yeah, ball was life at a, at a certain point. Like, I think up until I was maybe 15, which is old, I would wear jeans and basketball shorts underneath my jeans. OK, so I could play literally anytime you want to squat up. Let's go. Let's go. I'm going to just take my imagine if I had shorts on right now. Hoop shorts underneath these jeans. That's how it was. I would do that in high school because I like to play ball like during gym or during recess and stuff. You literally, that's crazy. Yeah, it was. Nobody does that now. No, it's kind of looked at as a scumbag move these days. It is a scumbag (laughs) move. So I would have like my little Penny Hardaways on and I would have my hoop shorts and I would have my jeans. Did you? I had the air pennies. Those were so sick. Yeah. I was the only girl playing hoops. So when we talked to Tara Vanderveer and she said she had to bring her own ball, that was me. Mm hmm. That was chilling. Tara Vanderveer, all-time winningest women head coach in history. Just spitting facts. 
So my my greatest ambition was to be a WNBA player. So I think a W an NBA pod is a pretty good backup. <laughs> yeah. I kind of love this. So I was pretty raw. Never learned about this like the type of footwork and skills that these kids now get. So that's kind of how I got into it. And I think it's important for folks to know that this, when you say, I don't know basketball, I take offense to it personally because this has literally been my life since I can (laughs) remember. So fuck off, basically. Um, Respectfully speaking, fuck off. I was honored also this week, like I said, to, to interview Tara Vanderveer. She was awesome, right? Oh, yeah. She was sick. She yeah. was very scary. Uh-huh. Yeah, she yeah, She was very intimidating. And that's saying something. I probably interviewed two, three hundred yeah. very high-profile people. She was at the top of the intimidation list. Her yeah. and Baker Mayfield are right there. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't smile for no reason. I'll say that. She doesn't smile almost <laughs> at all. The only time she smiled was when she uh, brought up that she um, makes Rice Krispie treats oh, with yeah. M&Ms in them. And I was like, I don't know why she's laughing about this, but I'm glad she has shared this with me. Her interview, like I said, is going to drop Friday show. She has been an engine for change. She has been the reason that the women's game has progressed as far as it has, that has become on national television. She is an innovator. We'll talk more about her leading up to the interview on Friday show. But as the game progresses, we start to realize it has not progressed far enough. It is not. uh, We saw what happened with the women's bubble in the NCAA tournament where they basically put a couple of Nordic tracks and some free weights into a random hotel conference room. Unreal. Unreal. Like almost like to me, it felt like Mark Emmert, the NCAA president was like, these women aren't athletes. They really don't need to lift. Like they just go out there and we just throw the ball up and they just put it in the hoop kind of. Yeah. I mean, it, it was despicable to start off with, but the fact that they thought they could just get away with that is just mind blowing to me. I mean, Mark Emmert's just, yeah. I mean, he's a piece of shit. Think about this. When Tara Vanderveer was growing up, there were no women's teams that existed. Right. They just did not exist. And that's Mark Emmerich's time, too. That's what his <laughs> memory is of basketball, only he has not tried to progress the game forward. So right. when he thinks of women and basketball, he's not thinking about them as legit elite athletes, which they would give Mark Emmert the business. I would love to see Ari <laughs> McDonald snatch Mark Emmert's ankles and him say that she's not an athlete, which he would he would immediately be like, oh my God. There are men who say that the women's game and the women's product just isn't as good. It's just, that's the reason that no one is watching. Not because there aren't enough media members covering the game, because There's just not any resources put into those media reporters showing up and covering them. There's not efforts putting in to doing one on ones and big showcases on people like Dee Dee Richards. Like I didn't even know until recently about her spinal cord injury because Mm -hmm. it was not covered. If there was a guy at Baylor that had a spinal cord injury and could not walk for a few days, we would be knowing all (laughs) about it. Right. Oh, yeah. So making these kids, these women into stars has not been top priority for media outlets. And a lot of the reason is, is because they don't think that that is profitable to put into. But like Field of Dreams, if you build it, they will come. That's what we're starting to see. That's why I wanted to have Erica on is to get her feedback about how we can build it. As that happens, it's happening at the same time as these new social platforms are emerging, giving players their own control of their personal brand. Dee Dee Richards has 60 plus thousand followers on TikTok and she's 20 something. Mm-hmm. They can no longer be ignored and are no longer at the mercy of places like ESPN. She's going to build excitement wherever she goes because of her. She's going to dance. She's going to sing. She's going to show her personality, elevating herself, elevating the excitement for the game, elevating her own personal brand. And also, very important to note, those people now can monetize by themselves. We do not need the NCAA to tell us what we can and cannot do. We do not need to be at the mercy of agents or the WNBA to broker us deals with Wheaties, which they're probably going to pay us pennies on the dollar. 
you know what? If we get an audience, that creator portal on TikTok is a monster (laughs) and brands will come find us and they will pay us for those numbers. And that's going to be, I don't think you can underestimate how important a, a place like TikTok is for the growth of the women's game. Because this stat tells you everything that you need to know. Eight out of the 10 most marketable, popular players in the NCAA tournament were women. That's fucking dope. Yeah, it's that is sick. so dope. That cannot be overstated. So, quickly, before we get into this DD Richards interview, let's just briefly, for those who don't know, talk a little bit about her journey. She grew up as a gymnast, she grew tall. Fast. Yeah. Her dad got her into the game and she she got into basketball, didn't even want to be involved in basketball, became dominant. She's the defensive player of the year in the entire country. And just this year, in practice, fell spinal cord injury. The doctors told her she may never walk again. Did you know this story? Uh, I didn't. But it's the comeback story of the year. Her, yeah. But yeah. It's the comeback story of the year. Mm hmm. And she played, not only did she play in the same season, she won the award and took Baylor as far as they, t- they went. There's three players on that team that, was in, that were integral to that, that team's success, and she was one of them. Mm-hmm. She is a captivating human and probably going to win an SB for that story. So let's get into it. All right, welcome to the pod. This is a special women's episode, a Wednesday episode. We've got... The one and only Dee Dee Richards, 60 plus thousand followers on TikTok, more on Instagram, killing the Twitter game prior to your arrival at Baylor. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. So when Baylor got the number two seed, is that when you knew that the fix was in? (laughs) (laughs) Um... (laughs) No, I mean, I should have known, huh? I mean, I should have been the first hint right there. It should have been the giveaway. But no, I was just excited that we even got that far, that we even had a tournament. We even had a selection show this year. So I guess I'm going to see. This was my mom always said, go with the women's intuition. I should have known. Yeah, the gut. <laughs> That's when I thought to myself, like, uh, I don't know about this. You should have been a one seed for sure. It got crazy whenever we played UConn and they started treating UConn like that, like they were the underdogs. I'm like, what? <laughs> They're the one seed, we're the two seed. How, like, what sense does that make, you know? And that just shows you who the real one seed is. I'm not saying that. I I'm know. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing that was some tomfoolery was that late game, no, no call. Mm-hmm. Take me through, take me through on your end what it's like to be on that side at that stage, a call like that or a no call like that. Um, it's really so like when it happened, you know, I'm sitting on the bench, not even sitting, I'm literally standing the entire time and I'm looking because, you know, at the end of the day, I knew they were going to foul because we were, we have been getting beat up all game. And I don't know, I don't know how many times I saw the revs throughout the game. Like, yo, we're not getting the same calls inside. And I just kept telling them our whole game is played inside out. So how are we not getting calls? Like y'all are, y'all are whistle so happy, but y'all aren't calling, you know, the right calls. And they just kept telling me it's the flow of the game. It's all that stuff. So getting to the end of the game and having that happen to us wasn't even shocking because I have been complaining about it all game, but it's just, it's sick to know that it was like your season was put at the hands of reps. You know, I just hate that. I hate that for our season and our team, because I think we had a really good chance of going pretty far. Yeah. It's interesting because I'm curious whether, because you guys are so physical that Mm -hmm. the fact that you guys set the tone in that physicality makes it harder for the ref to want to, to blow that whistle. I can definitely see that. Um, even being in the Big 12, I feel like we got we got we got the short end of the stick because we were Baylor and because we play so rough. So I can honestly see that being the problem. But at the end of the day, it doesn't make you right. And that kind of makes it, you know, more wrong that you can see it happening. But because if we end up shooting 100 free throws a game, we end up shooting 100 free throws a game. But that's just that's our game. You can't take that away from us, you know? Yeah, you're built that way for a reason. Right. <laughs> exactly. I loved Coach Mulkey after the game saying, (laughs) saying like, I'm not even going to give you a quote. 
What did you see? And print that in your article. Period. <laughs> then That's coming wrong. with the receipts. I um, seriously, because she had the phone, flipped the phone, took the mask off. It was it was very. I feel like when you have media, I feel like it should, they should give you time to pull down. I think they call her at the peak of her anger, honestly. Was there no space between the end of the game and that presser? Oh, no, ma'am. Um, we literally had a team huddle. She went and talked to her coaches for like maybe, what, three, five minutes. And then they took her and they to media. So I definitely think they got the short end of the stick. They got the angrier Kim. But at the end of the day, it's on Kim's time. Um, she goes where she wants to go. But I think she was so ready to talk to somebody. She sped through. She told us what we needed to hear, told us that we're going to leave tonight or that night. And that she was like, let's go. Let's go, Kyle. Let's go, DJ. Let's go to media. And we're like, OK. Wow. That's crazy. She was like, let's get this out. Let's let them mm-hmm. see it. Definitely. Uh, Dave said, if you, you don't get injured, you guys win by 10. I think that was a, a big momentum shifter, right? They went on a 19 0 run. Did you anticipate I, when you went down that it would change the momentum in that way or that much? I, I definitely did not anticipate that, you know, being, a, um, I'm a, we're all we're a great team. We're on a great team. So you kind of expect the, you know, them to hold it down to say the least, but it's, that's like losing Melissa Smith or losing DJ Carrington. I think if any of us would have went down, it would have been a game changer. And I think that's when you start to realize how much you rely on one another. Like you're, you're everyone's the strongest, their weakest link. And once that a big link comes out, it's kind of like it's that's what happens. I mean, not it was just, it was crazy to watch. I definitely looked down for a second, looked up, and it was we were only up by two. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, <laughs> what happened? So it was it was scary. From from the bench, could you feel it? The run happening? Yeah, I, like can I, you feel that shift? I definitely, I didn't feel nothing. I didn't see nothing because I was literally trying to get wrapped up. I was trying, I was getting stretched. They were trying to figure out if there was a knot or if they could feel anything in my hamstring. And I literally looked up and it was 55, 53, looked back down to get wrapped. And we were down by two. And I'm like, okay, I'm like, we got to move faster. And I said, this is happening quicker than I expected or that anybody expected, you know? So I don't know. It was, it was pretty crazy. It's still, it's still shocking. As soon as I got home, I watched the game like four times. Wow. Were you like, Hey, I got to get out there faster. Like help, help me out. Definitely. I was trying to figure out it. Cause with a hamstring, he just kept telling me there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. I'm like, just stabilize it for now. Like, cause every time I would run, I could feel it kind of jump or whatever. And I just, I, that feeling, that's what made it almost impossible to go back out there is the fact that every time I extended my leg, and you know how many times you extend your leg when you run in a game or when you <laughs> yeah. try to play defense? So I'm like, there's no way I can go back out there. But if they just, I was hoping that they just needed kind of my presence to feel kind of safer. And I was just hoping that I could just be out there. But I, I was doing more damage than helping at that point. Yeah. Did you watch uh, the Arizona-UConn game? I did. What did what was that like? That watching the rest of the tournament was, you know, kind of like a dagger in the heart. Not I'm so I'm happy for the teams that got there that made it to the final four or whatever. And I'm happy for Stanford winning, but I I know that we should have been there, you know? It was one of those to where I'm like it's fun watching, but I'm kind of bitter at home. And so it, it was I turn it on, turn it off. I turn it on, turn it off. So I watched it on and off. Watched the fourth quarter for sure. It was a good game. Um, I'm hats off to Ari. She's a she's a hooper. <sighs> Big hooper. I'm I'm most in awe at her height. Like I am her height, her swag. Because at that at, high, at that height, people are gonna doubt you, and she is continuously making people believers. She has a back. Her bag is deep. She's deep. quick. She has, she has, it's so sick being that small and being able to finish around the rim the way she does. That's so crazy to me. And the way that she creates space with her pivot uh-huh. foot going around. She did that, I think, a few times last night where she got separation from those girls who were 6'3", right. 6'4", and still got her shot off, and they were shook. She's mm-hmm. really, really good. Did you know that eight out of the ten trending women or trending athletes this year were women? Eight out of ten? I did not know that. 
So you guys are are becoming the women's women's athletes are becoming bigger brands than the men's side in March Madness. I believe it. I believe it. Why do you think that that is? What do you think has has changed? I mean, you've got a, a pretty big social following right now as it is. I really feel like it's I feel like there's no more dominant team. And that's what made the men's teams, the men's game so much fun to watch. There would be a 16 seed beating a one C one day. You know, it's stuff like that that made the men's game so much fun to watch. Now, not everybody is trying to go to a UConn. You have Kaylin Clark at Iowa, you know, making a name for Iowa, as well as uh, Megan Gustafson. It's just little things like that where that you now have women that are trying to make a name for themselves on the, on their own and put on for their own state or do what they want and go where they want. And everyone's trying to go to the Yukons, the Baylors, the Maryland's, the South Carolinas or the Notre Dame's. Everyone's trying to, you know, do their own thing and be the, be that man. And that's what made the men's game so much fun to watch is that they have so many players that are willing to sacrifice their, um, their sacrifice wins in order to get numbers. And I think that's what makes the women's game so much fun to watch now. Yeah, I mean, I think the relatability, the parity and the relatability is huge. You know, being For able sure. to, sh- to show your own personality on your own social. Mm-hmm. And there's, I just think there's a lot of excitement around the women's game. When you see it in e- on ESPN primetime, mm-hmm. that feels mm-hmm. really, really good. And I think that trickles down to a degree to the social media presence as well. Definitely. Um, it's, it's also the fact that there's so many different styles in the women's game. You have me with my puffs. You have Aaliyah Edwards with her um, braids. And then you have the different way, way people wear their tights or lashes and nails. You know, I think it's so many different things you can do to kind of personalize. It's like having a Jeep. It's yeah. like having a Jeep. You can personalize it in so many different ways to make it look so different. And then you make it your own. And people love to see how different we all are. Tell me about nails in season versus nails out of season. Do you see out of season? Yeah, I see it. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, this there's no way she's got the rock anytime soon right now. I'm telling you, I, I t- I'm taking like a week off maybe. And so I was like, my nail tech, I came back to Houston and I went to him and I'm like, I want them as long as possible. I'm not touching a ball for a week due to my hamstring. So that's just what I've been doing. But in season nails, they're they're not that far off though. You know, my in season nails are pretty long too. I, it draws a lot of attention online, evidently. So they're pretty long. They're longer than most. That's interesting. Was that an adjustment? Definitely an adjustment, but it was like it was something that had to be done. I don't think you understand when you get action shots back. And that your hand is just like man hands on the ball. Like it just bothered me. I was like, how can you tell the difference between me and Jared Butler? If you were to <laughs> see us on a picture and just saw our hands, I'm like, I just need to be, I need to be noticed that I am a female and I'm Dee Dee Richards. You know, I want you to know that Dee Dee Richards always has nails. <laughs> that is that becoming a part of your brand? Like, is that going to translate over to the pro side too? Yes, ma'am. Definitely nails and lashes. I don't know about the hair yet. I don't know what route I'm going to go with the hair um, next level, but definitely nails and lashes. I think that's something that's a given. Somebody asked me about this. A guy obviously asked me like, why, (laughs) why would women wear, wear lash extensions on the court? And I was like, man, it's, it's tough putting on makeup just to play. So if you have lashes on at least and maybe a a little bit of like BB cream, at least you still feel feminine. Yes. So I just heard about BB cream, y'all, literally the day, like, UConn game. Like, and I'm like, I got to go buy some. And now I'm still going to buy some. But I didn't know that was a thing. I wasn't wearing makeup in the games. I just have on my lashes and my, I I do my eyebrows and I put some gloss on. Right. And I'm like looking at all these girls on TV. I'm like, how does their skin look so smooth on camera? And someone told me BB cream. So I can't wait to try BB cream. It's a game changer and it doesn't mess up your face at all. (laughs) So, yeah, no, it's it's really interesting because it's not a flattering. Jerseys aren't that flattering anyway. And then you've got sports bras and the short size. And it's like, man, I really do want to differentiate and stay feeling exactly. feminine while I'm balling. Exactly. I'm definitely that's my next buy. My next buy. What is your take on the uh, I know you like to eat uh, good food. Mexican food's your thing, right? What was your Mexican take? What was your take when you got that first meal box? 
in the bubble. <laughs> and it's really, it's a simple fact that we were spoiled, you know? I think, I'm not speaking on every team. I'm saying Baylor, we were so spoiled coming into the bubble. We were eating so good, like steakhouses all the time. And then we get to quarantine in the bubble and it's like, I don't even know what it was, unfortunately. <laughs> I just looked at it and I was like, ooh, ooh who's, who's going to eat that? But like respectfully, I, I meant that in a respectful manner. It's just that we were so spoiled. I just was just like, I'm not eating that. But luckily, our coaches, this is what's crazy. Our coaches know us so well. Like, So who was in charge of that is this lady named Jordan Westbrook. And she calls all of us just literally the night before we leave for San Antonio. And she's like, y'all, y'all need to go to the grocery store. And y'all need to get y'all some things that should last y'all throughout the whole bubble. Because the option they're giving us to give y'all for food, none of y'all are going to eat. And I'm not trying to hear y'all's mouth. So sure enough, we all brought whole duffels of Uncrustables, sandwich meat, sandwich bread, ramen noodles, ravioli, Chef Boy RDs. We just stacked up to where everyone was complaining about food. And we were just like, y'all should have had y'all's mm. duffel bag. <laughs> mm, hate to see it. Couldn't be us. Could not no, be us. Couldn't, couldn't. <laughs> I mean, the fact that you even got to the bubble at all, I would say is you personally is probably the story of the year, right? You've gone... Um, you're going to win an ESPY. Let's be, that's <laughs> facts. That's facts. Um, you've talked a lot at length about this, about your story and your recovery. Um, but I'm really curious more so about the mental side of the comeback versus just the physical side. Oh yeah. Especially given the fact that you're one of the most, I mean, you're defensive player of the year. So taking a charge is your, that's in your bag. First charge right. back after the recovery Take me through that. You're sl- how, how are you thinking about sliding over and, and putting your body on the line after that? I, I mean, it was like, it was more of a, it was a huge obstacle for me to kind of even look at. So now I'm on the court practicing with my teammates. I'm at this point, I'm practicing with our dream team, which is our guys. And I'm just like, these are men. And if, if a girl hit me that like that and it messed me up, how is it going to be when they hit me? So if I think anybody can tell you, when I practiced the first day, I was really timid. I was, you know, go, going away from bodies, any screen, I wouldn't hit it. And I think I'm kind of known for hitting the screen and getting over it whenever I'm playing defense. And it was I definitely was shying away from contact for the first week, maybe. So when was your first in-game charge that you took? It, it might have been the first game back, UCF, I'm sure. Wow. Um, I got hit hard a couple of times in that game. And, you know, everyone kind of holds their breath or my team runs up to me and, like, looks at me. I'm like, get me off the ground, y'all. We just got a charge. Free, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, come on, what are we doing? <laughs> Wait, so you guys practice against the men regularly? Not our men's team, but uh-huh. our, our practice guy, our practice squad is guys. So oh. we're going against college men every day interesting that's cool um i know that basketball was not your first love gymnastics right right yes ma'am so how do you go from not caring if that is the case that's true to it becoming kind of your your life's work I don't know what I didn't like about it. It's just, I, I was so used to kind of chilling with my mom, my dad and my brother would go to practice, you know? So whenever I had to, my mom, no, it was my dad comes home one day and it's like, Hey, I saw a girls basketball team on the way here. Um, let's try it out. I'm like, for who? This is not a girl. My whole brother's not a girl. <laughs> so it's, I hated watching it. I hate, because I feel like it made my brother and my dad kind of argue all the time. They were yelling at each other. So I'm like, I'm, I, I'm not trying to do that. I don't need to get yelled at. One thing I don't do is like to get yelled at. So wow. I'm like, Dad, I'm not doing that. So that's really how it happened. And then I started playing. And ever since then, the rest is history. At that point, I'm just, now I'm having fun with it. Does Coach Mulkey yell? Does she yell? No, yeah, but I'm saying, so how does that, how does that stack up? If you don't like to be yelled at, and she's very much to me, seems like somebody who's very loose and free with the yell. Mm-hmm. <laughs> how, I, how was, does that work? It was definitely growing up with my dad yelling every second. And then 
I only played with one other coach that didn't yell. Like he is name is coach Chuck. He coached me most of my life and he didn't yell at all because he knew me. And he was like, Didi's so hard on herself. She doesn't need to get yelled at. She knows what she did wrong. But he was the only coach that felt like that after that, because every other coach I was with, they love to yell. And so it was something that I just came accustomed to. Um, I just got used to it. And being luckily, though, being with those coaches before Kim, I feel like they really prepared me because Coach Mulkey, that's a different kind of beast. You got to really have the right mental to be playing with her. I could I could see how that might be. <laughs> how would you describe besides yelling her coaching style? It was crazy because you wouldn't you wouldn't expect it, but definitely loving like she's super she's super caring um what like she's yelling at you yes but at the same time she's like nurturing you like that was like my mom away from home I I love coach Mulkey she definitely made it feel like a home whenever I was at Baylor regardless of her (laughs) yelling at me most of the time you know it's interesting she turns elite highly recruited players into superstars uh yes. Brittany being one yourself being one what do you think it is about her that is able to to do that she always she goes by this quote and it's um your chief one in life is for someone to make you do what you're capable of doing and I think she really takes that to heart because like you said she has this thing of taking really elite players and making them monsters so that's really what drew me here was that fact that she is, she has like a, a spell or something going on because she's so good at um, developing different players. And I really think it's her want to see everyone succeed. And then net, let alone her, com- her ability to compete. She's a super competitive person. You think she would be good as an NBA coach? You think that would be something that would translate over? Definitely. I think she's one of those people that just, they're going to succeed at whatever they do. That's, that's Coach Mulkey. And she's has this, you know, like this talent of being able to get the best out of anybody. And it's been only, you know, a couple of transfer, yes, but she has this thing where she can get the best out of you for sure. And that's, I feel like if you are at a WNBA in high school, college, wherever you are in the NBA, I feel like that's all you really need to do to be a good coach is to be able to get the best out of someone. Yeah, she talked about passion. She went on the one of our podcasts and talked about how she's able to use her voice to inject passion into her players and get them to, like you said, get the best out of them. Mm-hmm. There are NBA teams that are struggling with passion right now. Um, right. Boston Celtics being one of them, I think. Uh, Brad Stevens, we're seeing that some he has some issues um, getting that yelling voice on. Mm-hmm. What do you think would be some some potential fits for her in the NBA in terms of teams? Um, I definitely, I want her to, you know, me selfishly speaking, to go to LA so I can go visit. I have a crush on Kuzma. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all, Kuz? I, I need her to go there so I can go. So I'm going to say LA selfishly, but I definitely feel like teams like OKC that are kind of just struggling to get over that hump, I think they just need a push. So OKC, and then I was going to say Brooklyn in the last years, but they, they've recruited well. So I can't wait to see, you know, them keep prospering, you know, when everyone gets healthy. But definitely just teams that are struggling to get over the hump, I would stick a Kim there. Like, I would really go get Kim. <laughs> Same. Yeah, I think that would be a good a good fit for sure. You mentioned that you're a Kuzma fan, but you're also a, a LeBron fan. Um, right, I love LeBron. You said that the reason that Braun is better than Jordan is because he's defensive, his defensive versatility. Obviously you have quite a bit of defensive versatility. Do you think, (laughs) do you think defense is more important than offense? I just say like this, if I score one point and I hold you to zero, who's going to win the game? Cause I, I feel like you can't score on me. And if, if I'm playing better defense than you are offensively, then I'm going to win. And so that's why I've always felt like defense makes a, huge difference in like a game especially if you stop them early like if you kill their confidence early on defense they're not you know they're not gonna hit any more shots on you no more you're gonna get a flow because defense leads to offense I can get a steal and boom we're going out for a layup it's just things like that's why I've always felt like defense is gonna win you games who's the equivalent of you in the NBA 
I, I hear a lot of different things, actually. I hear like a, um, what's his name? I hear Draymond Green. Ooh, I like that. I, that's crazy. And I, when I heard that, and then everyone keeps saying, I have potential to be a Magic Johnson. And I'm just like, okay, these are good names I'm hearing. These are big names, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's definitely people that are going the extra mile or working hard, hard workers that are going to do the little things that aren't really shown on the stat sheet. <laughs> they love to compare me to people like that, which I understand. <laughs> I know that it's beyond your control, but I would be remiss to not ask what places uh, would be great fits for you uh, in the WNBA. So I don't know. I feel like I'm a, I'm a more of a chameleon. You could put me anywhere and I'm going to get, I'm going to get along. I'm going to figure myself out for sure. But I would love to, I think I'd love to be in LA. I just feel like I'm a more of a Cali girl. Um, and then I also love, watching the aces so it would be cool to go to those teams i like watching those two i immediately thought of you and lambeer together and i was like damn they would be tough i've heard that multiple times now like and i so like i'm kind of scared that i hope it doesn't go bad like i don't know um because i've been hearing that a lot so i'm like i hope so so everyone can see it fit i can see it fit i want to go there so i hope it works out and it's close to la it's only like a 30 40 minute flight so you'd be in and out you'd be in and out Dave Portnoy, huge Dee Dee fan. I, I rarely ever hear him say how much he loves an athlete. He DM'd me after the game. I literally almost like peed my pants. I'm like, whoa, well, like, he, and then he had the nerve to say, I know you don't know me, but I'm like, what? what do you mean I don't know you. <laughs> Everybody knows you, you know? So it was, it's just crazy. I'm so, I'm so grateful and thankful. And it's like, I want to be his best friend. Like he doesn't even know yet. (laughs) I think we're going to make that happen. I think that's a great way to end their interview. I will, uh, I'm going to let him know that you're in town. See if we can make a little magic. All right. So give me your info and I'm going to, I'm going to let him know and tell him you're Mm -hmm. in town. Okay. Like, how can I, you want me to say it right now? Yeah. We'll stop the recording. Okay. Marty, can you stop the recording? Hold, hold on, let me, let me just close it out. Didi, thank you so much for joining us. I am so grateful and congratulations on all the continued success. And um, also, hold on one second. Uh, and and let me just finish. Um, <laughs> so I've got like things happening in my ear. Didi, thank you so much for coming on. Um, it's an honor. Super grateful that you made the time. Congratulations on all the success. And uh I'm hoping for the aces or the sparks. Thank you so much for having me. This was this was so much fun. So thank you. Let's talk for a second about the final four game between UConn and Baylor. The women's game, of course. Freshman Paige Beckers. It's Paige Beckers, Paige Beckers, Paige Beckers. Yes. <laughs> Naismith player of the year. The talk of the town all season. 5'11", ridiculous handles. A great jumper. The player that Diana Taurasi, who is a legend in her own right, said was the best player right now in in basketball. <laughs> right now at 19 years old that she's the best in the women's game. It's crazy. That's crazy. And I love Paige Beckers. I do not want to discredit Paige Beckers because she is very, very good. She's fun to watch. So I want to, to say, like, this is no shot to her. But Ari McDonald is 5'6", and Paige Beckers is 5'11", and Ari McDonald in that Final Four game put Paige Beckers in jail. Do you know how hard that is? (laughs) 5'6", to put a player almost a half a foot taller than you in jail? It's tough. Five for 13, Paige Beckers was annoyed, frustrated all night. The whole world was thinking about UConn. And you know what? After that game, the whole world was thinking about Ari McDonald. She put up almost 30 on... UConn and locked Paige down. The player of the year was neutralized. Had 18, but it was a very, very quiet 18. And inefficient. And inefficient. Gino Ariema called Ari Allen Iverson out there. <laughs> he said she was AI out there and she looked like AI. She does kind of. Yeah. She I was like that. Crossing fools. Yeah. And that little floater she has. Totally. Yeah. So the world thought that UConn was going to blow the doors off of Arizona. They were 14-point favorites, and it really wasn't close the other (laughs) way. And Ari, to go off of the AI reference, was the answer. (laughs) She was the reason. She was the answer. 
that sent UConn packing on the highest stage. Like you said, hand, handles of AI or Kyrie locks down like Gary Payton or Pat Beverly. And when she's in the moment, when they interview her during the game, she is a monster. She is not afraid to tell you what's up. <laughs> I am that girl. I am that bitch. She doesn't say bitch, but she is that bitch. <laughs> she's going to be a superstar. Yeah. She is so humble. So we talked to her. That's the next interview is, is her. But we also had the chance to speak to the sports information director. He was on the, the FaceTime as well. He said that, and he's been there a while. He deals with a sports information director deals with every athlete, male and female, mm -hmm. on every sport. Yeah. And he said she was his favorite athlete of all time to work with. Not Nick Foles, not DeAndre Ayton, <clears throat> like plenty of guys and girls coming through those programs, multiple sports, football and basketball. And it was her irreplaceable, a star, humble, not a better human being to be around. And that is the girl that is the two time defensive player of the year and the Pac-12 player of the year as well. I just want to say, preface this interview, she is painfully shy. <laughs> she is, she took time to warm up. And when she does warm up, she is fascinating. She is charming. She is detailed. And she loves, she's a leader. Yeah. She talked about that team playing for her, that she is an extension of the coach on the court. She knows her place. She knows her role. And she's willing to do anything to win. I cannot wait to watch her progress. Let's get into the interview. 5'6", lefty, southpaw on the court, filthy handles, deep range, basketball IQ off the charts, never gets tired, relentless, a pest, swaggy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to this league, Ari McDonald. Please say Ari, not Ari, always Ari, my spirit animal. Like I said, I'm super pumped to have you on. Like, this is for real for me. Like, you were my favorite player in the tournament to watch, hands down. Hands down. Um, this episode for us, it's going to be an all-female episode. I've got you, I've got Dee Dee, and I've got our CEO on. And the main sort of point of the episode is to highlight female athletes and how important it is for them to be brands and how they think about themselves on and off the court as they're, they're building their career and how, I mean, eight of 10 of the most popular college athletes through March Madness were women. Don't know if you know that, but including you, by the way, uh, <laughs> I don't, did you not know that? No. <laughs> Do you no. not check these things? No. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be fun. Um, you were one of the youngest players ever to write a Players' Tribune article, which is all about how athletes go and tell their stories, how they want them told. Wow, I didn't even know that. That's crazy. Do you see yourself as a brand? I would say now I do. I feel like uh, now that I got my name out there, I think that I definitely see myself as a brand. And um, I'm excited about that. I mean... I want to be that person that little girls look up to. And I hope that through our March Madness run, I hope that I inspired little girls around the world. And and older girls. I am, how old are you, Ari? I'm 22. So I am 12 years older than you and you inspire me. Wow. That's big facts. Watching you and seeing your story and reading your story has been an absolute delight. I know you're soft-spoken, and I know you're trying to... That's been your story, right? Getting out there more and more and, and being more extroverted to the world. If you had to describe yourself and how you want the world to see you as a future WNBA star, because that is what you are going to be as a star, uh, how do you want to be perceived? Um, just off the court, I would like to be perceived as like a quiet person, but then on the court, just like a cold stone killer. Um, oh! Someone who just leaves it all on the floor, just, you know, just relentless and has that, like, killer instinct, that killer mentality. So, I mean, that's what I want to be perceived as. That. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's almost yeah. like a Mamba mentality. When you crossed your arms on that court against UConn, it was, I mean, when you did that, it felt like Giannis sitting in the middle of the court 
on Philly. To me, that's how it kind of felt like I am here. How, what was that to you? Just that moment. Like you said, it was like, I'm here. Like, this is what I've been waiting for. Like, I'm on this stage now and I'm just going to do my thing. And that's how I felt. And you was, I mean, you were so nasty. Everybody coming into that tournament or into that game was like, Paige Beckers, UConn, Paige Beckers, Paige Beckers, UConn, UConn, UConn. The world was, a lot of times, and, I, and I'm sure you guys felt this, maybe not you as much because it doesn't seem like you're deep into the feed of, of social media, but the world was tuning in to see UConn, and what they got was Arizona. Did you guys feel that way coming into that game? We did. Like, I mean, of course, like, we wasn't, like, literally like, just clicking on stuff. Like, could we follow, like, our social media content, like, slam and stuff. Like, you know, they were talking about UConn, leading up to UConn. And so I would, like, send my teammates screenshots. I'm like, hey, look, guys, like, motivation. And so I feel like we took, like, literally our theme for the tournament was, like, taking stuff personal and just believing in ourselves. And I would, like, just send my teammates stuff to try to motivate them. And, I mean, I feel like it worked. Kind of getting them a little bit, like, angry a bit. Yeah. <laughs> hey, they're sleeping on us. All they're doing is talking about them. And at the end of the day, I mean, you dominated. Um, you were one, and we'll talk about that game more, but you're one of my favorite athletes, especially in this tournament, because of how unapologetically you, yourself you are. When I watched uh, all of the interviews at halftime, which is, which is sort of crazy that they have you guys talk at halftime to me, um, and also post game. And the level of purity that you have and how you speak about what's going on at the time that the game is happening, along with the authentic voice that you have, is pretty rare, uh, given that most colleges, most programs, most people will try to manage athletes and how they come across. You don't seem to do that. You don't seem to uh, care much about that. Uh, you seem to be exactly who you want to be at all times. How do you do that? Just, I mean... In our program, I mean, everybody's genuine and authentic. And um, it just started with our SID, Adam. I mean, it's been a pleasure to work with him. And um, he lets me, he like allowed me to be myself during media. You know, I would ask him like about certain stuff and like, you know, what answer should I give? And he like, it's up to you. Like, I can't tell you what to say. So he just always allowed me to be me. And even Coach Barnes, like, they just let me be me. And I appreciate that. Cause they, I mean, they didn't try to filter me. They didn't try to tell me to be somebody other than myself or try to control what I say. So, I mean, I really appreciated that. Yeah. Not all programs do that. I mean, it's very clear that there are programs that tell their players what to say and how to say it. And it feels like the Arizona way, uh, coach Barnes, uh, yourself, some of the other players that I've heard, that's exactly what translates over. Um, so it's been really interesting to watch. I think it was really interesting how you decided to follow um, Coach Barnes from Washington to Arizona. A lot of players will choose programs based on the college or on the head coach or on the system and the schemes that they use and how they best fit in personally. It seems like the biggest reason that you chose Washington to begin with was because of Coach Barnes, right? Yes. What is it that drew you to her personally where – your your immediate thought was to transfer. You obviously stayed a year at Washington, but when she ended up going to Arizona, your immediate gut instincts, according to what I've read, is that you wanted to transfer, and then you ended up transferring. What was it about her and your connection to her that was so special? So I've been knowing Coach Barnes since I was 15 years old, and um, she was the first coach I talked to from Washington that was recruiting me, and we, we clicked so fast because she was relational, and I value relationships in my life. Like, that's one of the biggest things. And, you know, she would ask me, like, how I'm doing, how my family is doing. Like, it was just, it was stuff other than basketball. So I was like, okay, she cares about me and my well-being. She cares about my family. So I'm like, I really like this woman. And um, she was very understandable and very authentic and genuine. So I was like, okay, I, I love it here. And I love this woman. So, I mean, I got to go here. You had to set a whole year, though. That's tough. And you've already done it once. Not easy to make the decision purposefully to do it a second time. Um, that had to have been a tough decision to make, yeah? That was so tough. <laughs> um, but I, I've been through it before. It's sitting now set out in high school. So, I mean, I kind of knew, you know, what was ahead. You know, I knew what the team would look like. 
and I was just like, okay, I was preparing myself. Like, I mean, thankfully that my dad made me a mentally tough person. So, I mean, I was just thinking like, you got to get some out of this. You got to get better, make your teammates better. And so just work on the things you need to work on and just grow as a leader. So I was just thinking about that as I was sitting out that year. Yeah, you, you mentioned growing as a leader. What is it like to like be with a team, but not really with the team? It's, it's hard. Um, but you have to stay connected. Um, you have like, I have to really like speak to my team. I have to talk to them. Like I have to communicate with them, like on all levels. Like, but I mean, I feel like it starts with off the court. I mean, I love my teammates. I love they can do on, on the court, but off the court, I mean, I feel like that's the biggest, that's how I'll get my teammates to play hard for me and play like for me. So, I mean, just checking on them, how they're, how are they doing? Like, Oh, let's go get some coffee. Let's go get something to eat. Like, I mean, I feel like it starts off the court. And I mean, I feel like that's how I communicate with my teammates. And I feel like that translates to on the court for us, like playing together and just having that uh, intensity. So, I mean, I feel like it just starts there. Is it hard as an introvert to be the one reaching out to be like, hey, let's go get coffee. Hey, let's do this. Hey, let's do that. Knowing that maybe your initial like instinct is to wait for someone to invite you to do something. In the beginning, it was really hard because, I mean, I didn't want to come out of my shell. Um, I was just comfortable. I was content as a person, like who I was. And I was just like, you know, I, I had to like just tell myself, like, you can't do this. You're a point guard. I mean, you're an extension of the coach on the floor and your teammates are going to look to you. So I was like, all right, let me just get out of my zone. So I just start, you know, when I first got to Arizona, I was just getting to know my teammates better. And just the year after that, the next year, like I just blossomed into a person that, you know, wasn't afraid to tell my teammates the hard stuff, but also love on them and just to get them get to know them better. Uh, I saw an article where Coach Barnes had you speaking. Basically, she made you do pretty much everything. Every team building activity that she needed someone to speak at, you had to speak at. Uh, like that's a, that's an interesting experience, uh, for her to single you out for your growth. How, how do you describe her as a coach? Obviously she's pushing the hell out of you. Yeah. Coach Barnes is a player's coach. Um, she values her players' opinions and, um, she lets them do their thing. She lets them be them. Uh, she doesn't try to change them as a person. She doesn't try to change their game. She just try to add stuff to elevate us. And, um, like just playing with her or playing under her is free like she lets us play loose and I mean she doesn't try to hold anyone back and like her system just fits perfectly for us as players yeah she's she was you you passed her scoring record um uh, what was that party like what was that celebration like when when you did that she was happy for me. It was all love. Like she had joke around. She was like, all right, I'm going to take you out so you can't get in. I started laughing. <laughs> she was like, nah, I'm messing with you, but nah. After I passed it, she just gave me like a big hug. And she was like, I mean, records are meant to be broken. And I'm glad like somebody like you is like able to do that. So, I mean, she was really happy for me. Um, like I said, you know, everybody was coming into that UConn game, talking about UConn, talking about Paige. She's five inches taller than you, standing at 5'11". And you put her in prison. You lock, you locked, you put the clamps down, and then put up thirty at the same time. Not an easy thing to do. Uh, how do you strike that balance between being Patrick Beverly esque on the defensive side and and being that prolific scorer that you are on the offensive side? Besides just having great stamina. Yeah. Um just valuing like just knowing how important defense is like defense starts the offense so I mean and I'm the type of person like my mentality is just it's just different it's out of this world like you know the person I'm guarding like I'm making it hard for you the whole night so I mean and then just you know offensive end and like I mean I if it was up to me I would you know I would love to get more assists if it was up to me but I mean I feel like I got to score, you know, to get my teammates, you know, I get us in a game, get us going. But I mean, it's just valuing, just having that mentality. I mean, I just feel like I'm different. Do you trash talk? Mm, sometimes I didn't throughout the tournament, but you know, sometimes I do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could see people getting really annoyed by your defense, like really like outwardly verbally annoyed and frustrated and letting you know how they feel. Uh, do you have any sh stories that you could share about that? Um, Just, 
I've seen it a lot, just playing. Like, I haven't heard anything verbally, but, like, just, you know, I know when I get under people's skin on the defensive end, when they start pushing me yeah, and they get frustrated, I can just tell. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I love to see it. And that's how I know I'm in their heads. Like, I just know when they start to push me and shove me, I'm like, okay, I got it right where I want it. So, I mean, I, I experienced that a lot, I experienced that throughout, like, my whole basketball career. But, I mean, I love to see it. <laughs> jersey jersey pulling, elbowing, all kinds of shady things going on under the radar. Yes. I've seen a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> when I was watching, I was like, man, if I was who Ari was guarding right now, I would be so – because you never stop moving offensively, never stop moving, and then defensively you're basically, like, on their skin. Like, you, you are right there. Things that, as a, a defender on you and also as the offensive player, both just wear you the hell out and also get in your dome. So that was a fun thing. That was a fun thing to watch. Um, Gino Oriyama said that we had not played against a guard as good as Aerie all season. You have, as you know and have said, have been consistently slept on your entire career. When a coach of that caliber – who's largely considered one of the best NCAA coaches in history, says that we haven't seen anyone as nice as Aerie all year, and we got smacked in the mouth. What is that like knowing that you have been slept on this whole time? I mean, just getting a comment like that from Coach Gino, that meant a lot. And um, he's one of the legends in the game. So I was like, wow, like that's crazy. And just, I mean – just for him to say that, I feel like it kind of got people looking around like, well, well, why is this player being slept on? So, I mean, it was just crazy when I seen that. And I mean, I was a little juice. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Did you feel like the NCAA, uh, this tournament was your coming out party to a degree? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, despite us not, you know, not winning the championship game. I mean, I feel like this is uh, my coming out party. And I feel like my teammates and I put Arizona back on the map. Yeah, no doubt. And it was interesting because you led that the tournament in scoring. Was that something that you thought about coming in at all, or did it just kind of happen? It just kind of happened. Like, I was playing out of my mind. Like, I was telling my dad, I was like, I'm having an outer body experience. Like, I'm playing. Like, I played well, like, throughout my career in at Arizona. But, like, I don't know what it was, but something, you know, I just elevated my game, and I was just trying to win and get to the natty. It it was crazy. (laughs) To see you in the second half against Stanford, which largely are filled with girls who are like six foot above, uh, one girl, six three, and still be able to create separation was, I mean, to me as a fan and as someone who's your exact height is sort of crazy because you could tell they wanted to send your shit all the way into the stands. Right? They did. They did a few times. <laughs> yeah, they did. Um, who do you think is the equivalent of you on the floor uh, in the NBA game? Do you have someone that you look up to in terms of how you model your game after? I would say I can see a little bit of Kyrie in me uh, with the crackness and be able to create create my own shot. I see a little bit of that in me. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. I know you. this is beyond your control. Uh, Dee Dee said that she would prefer to land in either L.A. or in Vegas for the Aces. In a perfect world, where do you think suits you best? I will honestly say just, I don't know exact team, but a young team, you know. Um, but honestly, just wherever I'm needed. I mean, I don't even have to score at the next level. Um, if you need me to do the dirty work, keep playing tenacious defense, I'll do that. But just wherever I'm needed and wherever they need young players and just wherever, you know, I fit in a program or, you know, an organization. Well, congratulations on all of the success. Uh, it was a tremendous pleasure to, to finally get you on. I cannot wait to see where you land. I'm definitely going to be tuning in. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you so much. For our final interview today. <laughs> We've got our very own Erica Nardini, Barstool's dynamic CEO and one of the most important women in sports and media. So I don't know, I don't talk about this much, but before I got to Barstool, you think about when you're in content and when you're a personality, you think about where the industry is going and how it's changing and what your place is inside of it. And no one has been 
more forward thinking, more innovative, more vocal about the changing dynamics of the landscape and how personalities fit inside that than Erica. So when I was at USA Today doing my thing, trying to find out my place, I consumed every single thing that Erica ever said. I was like, man, it would be dope to get into a room with her for 20 minutes and just pick her brain on, on the industry. She thinks about media personalities and personal brands in a way that's, I think, different than probably anyone I've ever heard. Like the way that she talks about how athletes should become, she'll talk about this coming up. She thinks about them like characters. Yeah. Like something that you lean into, not just who you are, your normal every day, that you are an amped up version of you for the world. Yeah, no, it's really fun to hear her talk about that. Yeah. It really is. That is why I am not surprised that since she has arrived at Barstool that we have exploded mm -hmm. and grown tremendously. So because Erica is so interested and open in everything that happens at Barstool, so collaborative uh, and personable, it's kind of easy to forget how important she is in this space. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you know, in the wider world. I mean, she's on the board of the WWE, for God's sake. Yeah. That's how important she yeah. is Ever to- Ever heard of it. And, yeah, WWE, Worldwide Wrestling <laughs> Entertainment. Oh, uh, yeah, no big deal. MBD, kind of a big deal. It's, it's crazy. She is that important to entertainment, and the WWE is entertainment on the highest stage. Mm -hmm. And scripted drama, like, think about that and translate that into sports, and it's just tremendous. This is a woman who knows sports, who knows branding. So what a better way to wrap up this episode than to get Erica's opinion on branding in the context of women's sports and how we can leverage that to grow the game. Welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me. CEO of Barstool Sports, none other. Erica Nardini. Hi. I am so excited to have you on because I just had on, which will be for Friday's episode, the winningest women's coach of all time in Tara Vanderveer. Mm -hmm. And then two of the top women's athletes in the NCAA tournament as well. So this is a big episode. Huge episode. So I wanted to talk to you about women's brands. Okay. And women athletes specifically okay. and how we can use media to not only grow brands, but to grow the game. Okay. No one has been, for folks who don't know, nobody has been as vocal pushing women's sports and how we can leverage uh, emerging platforms, we'll call it, in order to grow the game. And on top of that, you have become quite a brand yourself along the hmm. way uh, with Token CEO and everything that you're doing there. So I was talking to somebody the other night and they told me, because the women's game was on, and they said, the reason that the women's game is not as popular as the men's game, we'll just say basketball to basketball, okay, is because the product is not as good. Mm -hmm. That is... The lies that we are told. Yeah, that's like the A1A excuse, which I have to be honest, outside of the Gonzaga game, the UCLA game was electric. That was For an sure. amazing game. But that Baylor game, the Baylor women's game up until that point was the best game I'd seen in the tournament. For sure. And la uh, two nights ago's game, the national championship for the men's. Was trash. Yeah, it was a boring game. Sucked. So to you, you're an athlete yourself leading expert on media, if some jamoke says to you that, mm -hmm. what is your response to that? I think it's like anything else almost, which is people, it's the same people who are like Barstool Sports sucks. Barstool Sports is a misogynistic, blah, 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 women hating, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what? Is it's just headlines. It, when is the last time you read something on Barstool Sports, watched something on Barstool Sports, clicked on something and the answer is never. The answer is always never. So I think, you know, I think it's very easy to brush off women's athletics as like, quote unquote, the product isn't as good. Women aren't as fast. Women aren't as strong. Like, and I think that's generally bullshit. I also, and I think if you give it a chance, you can get really into the women's game. Women's World Cup, for an example. Women's World Cup, women's basketball, women's hockey, women's track and field. Like it doesn't actually matter if you invest the time to watch and be bought into the athlete who's performing, then you, that that excuse, I guess, goes away. I do think that women's athletics has a problem in that the the w women's athletics still markets women in a way that's a very good girl, perfect, mm. obedient. Yes. Be diminutive. Yep. Be be you know be have decorum like. 
women's women's athletics, men's athletics have stepped out where you've created these outrageously sized characters. Like I remember, you know, in your world, when I was in, I guess, high school and college, I was really into Duke versus LSU. And I was really into Shaq. I loved Christian Leitner because he was such a dick and he was such a bad character. And when he put his foot on the gut, villains, I do love a villain. I love a villain. I think you should be a villain, but um, that's a different topic for a different show. But um, he was so bad and that made him so interesting. And Shaq was so big and that's and jovial and, you know, he's down in Louisiana and that's what made him so captivating. And you really haven't seen female athletes break out into these egregiously outsized characters. And I think when you find the Dennis Rodman of women's basketball. And when you find the Shaquille O'Neal of women's hockey or the Rob Gronkowski, right? Like I love Kelly Babstock. She's my hockey younger sister, you know, basically. And she, I think Babs is like Gronk. She's like a huge, gregarious, obnoxiously fluid player. And she celebrates well. And so I think that women's athletics needs to embrace some of the violence, some of the drama, because that's the stuff that at some of the badness, that's the stuff that people glom onto. Yeah, that's an interesting point. And that was I was going to talk about that later on. But you had Venus and Serena. Mm-hmm. Venus, very demure, very classy. And Serena decided, you know what? I don't give a fuck. I'm going to be me how I want to be doing things like off white in her uniform, Mm -hmm. really making tennis very mad. Correct. And in the headlines for mostly negative things and has become this much larger brand than Venus. Mm -hmm. Why don't you think that this is as accepted to be a villain or to be as authentically yourself and how much do you think that that is changing to be outspoken and unapologetic as a woman athlete? Look, I think the caliber of female athletes is extraordinary right now. Like the field is extraordinary. It doesn't matter what sport you're in. My observation is that the first thing women start with is how they look. Yeah. Which I noticed in this tournament, the hair was incredible. The nails, the eyelashes, like the look starts first, which is, you know, Serena, Serena championed her own look. She was like, fuck you, tennis. I'm not wearing whites. I'm wearing whatever I want. Billie Jean King did the same thing when she was big on the circuit. I think that women are less encouraged or more encouraged to be silent. Um, And women, just by virtue of how we're raised, are taught to be more obedient. So it takes a lot to step out. It takes a lot to be obnoxious. It takes a lot to be hated, to be hated, to have your coach pissed off at you, to be in the middle of a firestorm and to play well is a challenge. There's less role models for it. There's less people around you to support you in it. You know, you look at Sedona, you know, Sedona broke yep. the NCAA story. Now she did it in a way that I thought was brilliant, which is she didn't make her reaction part of the story. Yeah. She just reported the facts in kind of a light, slightly sarcastic, playful, b- playful way. Right. And I think the other thing with women is that I think women having a reaction almost elicits a more negative reaction. I mean, big facts. Yeah. Big facts. I feel like there's a lot of, not to make this about me personally, but I feel like there's plenty of times where in my career over time and as an athlete, I, they called me baby sheet playing basketball. I got the most amount of texts all through high school because I would say what was on my, I mean, that, that was a bullshit call. Mm-hmm. You know, that was, you know, she took my legs out and no foul and tech. Immediately. Yeah. Yeah. When I know that the guys that I would play, I mean, and I grew up with all boys. Sure. So you communicate in that That lens and that POV from a quote unquote male Mm -hmm. perspective. But what that ends up turning into is a lot of negative responses from those in power, from those who are around you. So I guess the question is, if you are you being who you are and a league a, a women's league says, Erica, we want you to blow us up. We mm-hmm. want you to turn us into just as big as the men's mm-hmm. league is. Is that one of the things that you 
you do first is to allow villains and and kind of push that WWE like these bigger than life characters? Yeah, I would. I think that people love characters and you know, this is what happened with the PLL. Like I was like chewing Paul Rabel's ear off about how he needed a villain, how he needed somebody who people didn't like, who was good like that. And I would, I would want that. I think when you look at the way women's athletics are marketed, it is so much about a social message. It is so preachy. Yeah. It's like, Hey, we help young girls. Like, Hey, be your best, you know, which all of that is very awesome. Like daytime specially. It's super daytime specially. And it's almost like you get to the top and then all of a sudden you're supposed to be good and you're supposed to be giving back, which I think women are good and they do give back. Being good and giving back doesn't mean that you can't also be completely wild yeah, or completely unfiltered. Imagine if you had like Alex Cooper and Alex Cooper was on the women's national team. Yeah. And she had a raunchy sex podcast or was just using her TikTok and her Snapchat and her Instagram to talk about sex. If you had that, the ratings and the viewing of Alex Cooper and women's soccer would be so much higher. For sure. So like, I think that's, you know, Megan Rapino has done that, but Absolutely. she's done it in a way that is you know, Megan, per Megan Rapino is extremely professional. Yes. Very outspoken, but she's like on the path. Very sharp. Very sharp. You don't feel like there are women who, I guess, aren't thinking about what their message is at all times. Do you know what yes, I'm saying? Yes, I agree. Women seem much more packaged in the like, this is your path, Meg. And now, I Look, I think Megan Rapinoe is a stud. For so sure. I think she's driving her own bus, no doubt about it. But it's very deliberate. It, she, the woman is on a, on a mission. And the other hard thing about women right now is like, there's just so much to fucking do. Like, yes, we need to be paid equally. Yes, we should have more visibility. Yes, more than 4% of all sports coverage should be about women's athletics. So like... Megan Rapinoe is like, am I going to go fuck around and talk about sex or be obnoxious or be like Alex Cooper? Or am I going to like really try to make something happen? And I think the reality is you can do both. The other great thing is most of athletics have a team. So, you know, when you, can you have one Alex Cooper, and you, one can, Megan have an Alex Cooper. you yeah. can have an Alex Cooper, you can have a Trista, you can have an Erica, you can have all these different characters. That's what I really have loved about Barstool is that I think we've allowed such freedom for people to develop who they are without any real coaching and without any real channeling. And I think there's a risk to that. And, you know, everybody does nothing, but people who have really leaned into themselves and who they are and what this character is, those people can really rise to the top. You look at, you know, I talked to Sasha Banks this week, like Sasha Banks, is going to have two black women are going to headline WWE's WrestleMania. Wow. That's like amazing. You know what? It, and, you know, it's Bianca versus Sasha and their tag team partner. So they're turning against one another. Sasha's whole moniker is be a boss and she's sexy and she's flip and she's kind of a bitch. And it feels like, like WWE is the first they have place more for that. out there female characters. Absolutely. And like, I think if, if the media, well, actually, let me take a step back. I do think the media could cover women's sports differently, but I, you know, like I'll give you an example. Like I follow on Instagram, like all the, like the gist and see her and like blah, blah, blah. And all of it is trying to per portray women as perfect. Yeah. And my thing is like, where is the girl? Like, did you, like, I don't know who watched Kong versus, did you watch Kong versus Godzilla? No. Fucking excellent movie. Good. But like Kong, like completely blasts Godzilla. And I'm like, where's that? Right. With women. Yeah. Where is the Dennis Rodman? Where is yeah. that? But I think a lot of that is the brands that want to align with perfection. Mm -hmm. Well, I, look, it's, it's going to be a catch 22 because... Yes, brands like Procter and Gamble and the other CPG companies and beverage companies and banks and everybody wants this, you know, it's great to have a female spokesperson. She's probably way more polished. She's probably extremely obedient. She'll do what you tell her to do. She's going to do the read well and you have a low risk of controversy. For sure. You get a Dave Portnoy read and you're like, eh, I never really know what you're going to get, but you're going to get a million times more 
followers and traction and visibility from a Dave Portnoy character, someone who's never professed that he's good right? versus this emblem of perfection. So at some point to really make the money move, you have to gain more audience. And the way you gain more audience is you create a better product or you create a storyline that people can't live without, that they just are so attuned to. So from a, if you were pitching a brand mm-hmm. on taking a risk on an athlete mm-hmm. that was controversial and outspoken, we don't really have that many of them um, that are allowed to do that. But say you did have like a Gronkowski or mm-hmm. a Dennis Rodman in, in female form, completely unfiltered, unpackaged, unmanaged, and you wanted to blow her up from a branding perspective and you had brands other than like no, no shot to CBD, but like, I think women villains or women characters can do better than that. Yeah, definitely. For well, sure. Yeah. How do you pitch uh, a woman like that to a brand that is conservative or traditional, like not just like an alcohol company or a drug company? Yeah. I mean, it's the same way with us. Like at the beginning, we had beer companies, we had gambling companies, and then we had just like the direct response soup. And now we work with Verizon and we work with Chevy and we work with big brands who It took them five years to come along. You know, I think the really cool thing that's happening right now is if you look at what's happening in the NCAA, female athletes are going to have an avenue for revenue that comes outside of the traditional advertising model and endorsement model of sports. So what that means is that the more influential you are, the more money you will get. And when you think about what makes people influential, it's opinion. And opinion breeds controversy. So what we're talking about is going to happen just by virtue of the lifting of the name, image and likeness rules. The second thing is you've got to, you know, I think there's a way to spin any brand to be relevant. Are you trying to portray a message of strength? Are you trying to portray a message of empowerment? Are you trying to portray a message of stress? or of winning or whatever it is, like you can parlay any of these things into those attributes. Women's empowerment doesn't need to be like, bling, my teeth are so sparkly white. I'm like so earnest. Like it doesn't, I think what we do, what you do, I think what I'm doing is empowering women. I'm not doing it in a way that is like squeaky clean and perfect. Facts. The, like the opposite of that. <laughs> but I think if, you know, New Balance is like, I want to connect with young women and encourage them to think differently about our brand. That's a great way to do it. And I think the same was true for female athletes. Why is this? Imp- I mean, you've been so vocal uh, at one point leading the charge for women's hockey still do. Uh, why is that important to you outside of just being a female athlete and just having a vagina? Uh, I mean, I love sports. Um I love sports. Like I love the drama and the, the just the athleticism and the game and the suspense and the fact that it happens and then it's over. Um, you know, I, I worked hard to support women's hockey and obviously kind of got burnt on that. So I don't know. I feel actually sad. I stopped skating after that happened. You did? Yeah. Which like I kind of bothers me in retrospect, but It just took away my love for it. Do you know what I mean? It was like, fuck these people. Like, why am I putting my heart out there? But I think that what I really believe is that the world has changed and that there's so much freedom for new brands and new ideas and new people. And women are going to fill those places. And people of color are going to fill those places. And people with freaky backgrounds or who identify as this, that, or the other thing all of these spaces are going to be filled by misfits because the world is becoming so open by virtue of social media and the you know changing distribution that it's just going to create a lot of opportunities for women i think i'm a product of that opportunity and i just you know i want to see people win how close do you think we are to getting to this place where you do see these villains and these characters in women's sports? I think they're already there, to be honest with you. I think they've always been there. I think, you know, you know, you were in a locker room. Like I was in a locker room, like 
We had lazy people. We had people who were total bitches. We had people who were goody two shoes. Like we had infighting. We had people stealing each other's boyfriends. Like so, we need hard knocks for women's. We sports. need hard knocks for women's sports. That's actually what we should create. That's a good idea. I think that's a fantastic yeah, idea. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with put that. Put that idea. down on your notes. I'm going to put that on my notes. Really quick statement. I just wanted to tell you, Dee Dee Richards came on. Yeah, and you were talking about lashes and nails. Mm-hmm. She said that the reason that she wears long nails. The reason that she wears long nails is because she wants to make sure that when Getty takes a photo of her shooting a ball, that everyone knows not only is it a woman and not a man's hand, but it's Dee Dee fucking Richards. Yes. See, I love that. Like she is cognizant of her brand. And I think TikTok and these emerging platforms and obviously this rule change is a big reason why people are going to be able to take control of their own narrative. Yeah, I think it's so cool. I mean, women are embracing the everybody. Every athlete is embracing the aesthetic. Like you look at Miles Jones, like Miles Jones, who's one of my favorite lacrosse players, you know, he's six something, six huge. And he is a stunning black man with blonde hair. Like he's got this shock of blonde hair. Like it makes you look at Miles Jones. The fingernails are the same. The eyelashes make women look, you know, like it's the tattoos. Like I think Athletes have always been expressing themselves. You look at The Rock, you look at anybody who wants to build a brand. Part of the brand is how you look. And I think the next phase of it is going to be uh, what people say. And I think that's where people like Sedona have done such a great job. Or as you see, like more players mic'd up on the court or on the field or whatever, like it's just going to it will organically happen. And then to be honest with you, there's such pressure, you know, we don't, we face different types of pressure in this company, this company, but like NBC, ESPN, Turner, they're under a fuck ton of pressure to feature more women. So it's like the whole thing is kind of moving in the right place. Thank you for joining Thanks us for last minute. Me. You look phenomenal. For I'm those, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Go on YouTube and check out Erica's dress. Thanks for coming on. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. That is all the time that we have for the This League special episode podcast. Please like, please subscribe, please rate, please rate and review on Apple and on Spotify. We have This League hoodies on sale in the Barstool Sports Store. We also are going to be coming out with playoff merch soon. Uh, Please do not forget to follow us at at This League and at Trista Crick on TikTok and on Instagram. Please watch the interviews on YouTube because I think that they're much better visually. Uh, And then follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you so much for listening. Tune in Friday morning for the next episode of this league. We're going to be interviewing the coach of the national champion team, Stanford, Tara Vanderveer. I forgot to mention that earlier in the episode. She's a fucking champion right this second. Uh, <laughs> and the winningest coach of all time uh, in women's game. All right. We'll see you Friday morning. Thanks for listening and watching this league on YouTube. If you like this content, please hit the subscribe button right here. More content will come your way straight to your feed. Thanks for watching.